Some churches have uh, sunrise services in April. We have parking lot services in September. So I'm glad that the Tom took a moment and sort of explained because it is true that we have uh, a lot of people that are worshiping with us today that weren't worshiping with us during or a couple years ago um, when we all went through pandemic together, the early stages of the pandemic and the way we uh, sort of survived as a worshiping body. Uh, we, we didn't meet for about six weeks after it started and tried to learn how to stream a lesson and, and communion and that kind of thing. Uh, and then we, as, as he mentioned, we started uh, assembling in the parking lot and for six, about six months did that. And so uh, a lot of places didn't have a setting where they could do that. A lot of places didn't meet that entire time as, as a body. We were able to, I think that showed uh, your toughness and, and sometimes we need to remember things like that. You know, today is, is uh, September 11th and we're remembering as a nation today an awful event 20 years ago. Sometimes you remember tough times and, and getting through tough times and, and that time, which was very scary for us, um, we need to remember, and some of us liked it out there. Now I'm not, we're not naive enough to think everybody loves meeting out there. That's why we don't do it every week and haven't for a couple of years, but next week, Lord willing, weather willing, we will. And we hope you will be able to be a part of that. So last Sunday morning, I began with a story concerning a golfer, and I hope you'll bear with me again this week along those lines. This is about a preacher who was a golfer, a very avid golfer. Every chance he got, he would be found on the golf course swinging away. It's sort of an obsession with him. He shall remain nameless to protect the guilty. But there was one particular Sunday that came up that was just a perfect, perfect day for golfing. Sun was out. There was no clouds in the sky, and the temperature was just right. And he was sort of, because of his addiction, uh, sort of in a quandary as to what to do and debated with himself. And shortly, the strong urge to play overcame him. And so he called the associate minister. And he told him that he was sick and that he wouldn't be at church. And, and so he uh, packed his car up and drove three hours to a golf course where no one would recognize him. And very happily, he began to play the course. Meanwhile, up in heaven, there was an angel watching all of this and saw what the preacher was doing. And he was quite perturbed. And he went to God and he said, look at that preacher. He should be punished for what he's doing. And God nodded in agreement. And so the preacher teed up his ball in the first hole and, and swung at it, and it sailed effortlessly and powerfully through the air and landed right in the cup 400 yards away. Picture perfect, unbelievable, impossible shot. Well, the angel was in shock, and he turned to God and said, begging your pardon, Lord, but I thought you were going to punish him. And God wisely smiled and said, think about it. Who can he tell? <laughs> punishment, punishment can take all kinds of forms, right? Just like disobedience can take all kinds of forms and even false teaching can take all kinds of forms. We're gonna see that as we continue our study in the Little Testament, the New Testament letter of Jude today. I hope you uh, took some time and read through Jude. You wouldn't have had to take much time. It's just a one chapter book. And I hope you'll continue to do that in the coming weeks as we work our way through this brief series. But I just want us to begin at uh, Jude 1 this morning. 
and read down through verse 4. Jude chapter 1. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So there is quite a bit there in just a couple of verses, and that's really always the case with the Word of God. But our message this morning is is entitled, Want Versus Need. And that comes from right there in that third verse, where I hope you notice that Jude says that this was not the letter that he wanted to write. He had something else entirely in mind that he wanted to write to them. He wanted to give them sort of a positive letter about their common salvation. He wanted to write a joyful letter that discussed those things that they held in common in Christ Jesus. Maybe he wanted to write something about heaven. Maybe he wanted to write something about what Jesus said or did. Maybe something about forgiveness and grace and the mercy of an all-loving God, that's what he wanted to do, but he had found out that he needed to do something else entirely. And that is just a fact of life that we all contend with, isn't it? If we're living life authentically, if we're being real about things, you know, there are things that we want to do, and then there are things we need to do. Sometimes those things conflict. Not always, but sometimes they conflict. And we have to choose what is needful rather than what we want at the moment. I know as a preacher, it is much easier to preach a positive sermon than a negative one, at least for me, I think for most guys. It is probably a lot easier for you to listen to a positive message than a negative one. But the fact is, sometimes we have to make the choice that Jude made here. Sometimes we have to do the needful thing rather than the preferred thing. See, Jude uh, had, had, had a real choice to make here. He was, he was eager again to write about, it seems, salvation, the salvation they shared, but he needed to write to them and, and to appeal to them, to exhort them to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That phrase there is probably the, the most famous phrase from this little book of Jude, contend for the faith and I've heard it uh, as a listener of sermons my entire life I've heard that over and over and I just wish that more often I had heard people explain what it meant in Jude um, when when they use that that well-known part of Jude Jude apparently was not eager to contend for the faith he was eager to write about salvation But he found it necessary at that time in that setting to instruct these people to contend for the faith. And I'm sure that there will come times in our setting when we need to do the same. When those times arise, we can't shrink back. We cannot shrink back from contending for the faith. But that is not, and I repeat, 
not what being a Christian or even being a preacher is all about 100% of the time, contending for the faith. Having said that, it is what Jude's audience needed to do at that particular time. They needed to contend for the faith. We'll get into why here, here in a moment, but I want you to, to see how Jude describes the faith here, what he calls the faith. For Jude, the faith is a set of beliefs that are worth standing up for. Okay? To, and then to contend in this phrase, contend for the faith. That word contend, that's a very powerful word. It can be used uh, of something like to fight for victory on the battlefield or, or in the arena. Uh, I can use sometimes like a, of a wrestling match. It can mean to struggle for, to, to debate, even to bring a lawsuit. A lot of times it was used for some sort of athletic concept. Uh, contest where um, great effort needed to be expended to compete and, and to win a victory. So to contend for something meant hard conscious effort. It was serious business what Jude was calling on them to do. But Jude uses a, a big long phrase to describe the faith that they were to contend for. Look what he calls it. He calls it the once for all deli delivered to the saints faith. Sort of a long descriptor. The once for all delivered to the saints faith. And that's meaningful, and I don't want us to miss that. Jude, of course, is uh, writing in the first century A.D. He's maybe 30, 35 years after the time of the gospel events, after the time of Jesus and uh, the beginning of the church at Pentecost. So already by that time, about 30, 35 years later, uh, just really at what seems to us a brief time, Jude claims that there is a set of beliefs. Uh, there is a faith that is established, and it's worth fighting for. In fact, he says it even more strongly than that. He says, this faith was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, that's an important New Testament phrase. You might remember over in the book of Hebrews, this phrase, once for all. It's used there over and over by the writer of Hebrews to talk about Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. I hope you remember his use of that. When the Hebrew writer is trying to show the difference, he's sort of comparing the old system, the old religious system uh, of blood sacrifices that you can read about in the Old Testament. He's comparing that with what Jesus has done. So he's talking about sort of the, the blood of bulls and goats, and then he's talking about the blood of Jesus given on the cross he does so by using this phrase once for all, but he applies it to what Jesus did. Jesus' work is once for all. Jesus died on the cross and offered himself as a sacrifice that never had to be repeated. He doesn't have to do that ever again. It is once for all. Now Jude, about 30 years later, says that there was a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. A set of beliefs, a body of doctrine, if you want to call it that, a standard of teaching, once for all passed on to the church to Christians. And Jude says, this faith is worth struggling for. It's worth contending for. I think here's one of the places where Jude really speaks to our time. Our, our time today in the modern church. Jude, remember, is a letter written to the church. He's not writing to outsiders. This is about us. He, he's talking about a, a problem that the church faced in his day internally. 
And so he speaks to us today in the church as well. Here's the problem. Among us, I'm convinced that Jude speaks to. You take our efforts as, as Christian people today to teach. We want to teach people about love, the love and the mercy and, and, and the grace of God. Okay? Very important. That's what we want to share with the world, isn't it? But you take that and you mix it with our culture's number one virtue. In fact, probably the only virtue our culture teaches today, which is tolerance. You take our teaching of the love and mercy and grace of God and you mix together, mix in our culture's teaching of tolerance Mix those two together, and sometimes what you get is a very watered-down version of faith that is not the biblical faith. And too often through my years, I have come across Christians whose basic perspective is, I believe what I believe, and they believe what they believe, but I don't want to be judgmental. And, and after all, can't we just all get along? And sort of hold hands, stand in a circle, sing kumbaya. And so in, in that attitude, the, the mere mention of doctrine is frowned upon. Absolutes make people very nervous today. Saying some things are just right and some things are wrong. Some things are always right and some things are always wrong. Seems too old-fashioned and too out of step in our times. But Jude writes about a faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Just like the blood of Jesus was once for all offered for the saints. So I have to take that seriously, don't I? If he uses that language, once for all, Jude writes about a faith that is worth contending for. It's worth standing up for. It is worth defending. Brothers and sisters, we have to be careful in our efforts to be kind, and we need to be kind, in our efforts to be gracious. We need to be gracious. In our efforts to be patient with people, we need to be patient. But in that, we have to be careful that we don't unintentionally rip all the content out of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus has always offended people. It's an offensive thing, what Jesus said. Because it claims exclusive truth. Jesus says, I am the way. No, no other way to God but through me. It claims exclusive truth. It demands obedience. And it calls for a certain way of living. And a certain way of not living. And I'm afraid there's awful strong temptation for us in modern times. And, and that some, some modern Christians have... Um, given into, so concerned about fitting into their culture, they become so open-minded about things that their brains have fallen out. God wrote this book. He writes the story. We don't write the story. It was once for all delivered to us. Our job is to understand it as best we can, obey it as best we can, live it as best we can, and teach it as best we can. One person, I think, said it so well in this little quote. They said, there is a set of beliefs based on the teaching and work of Christ, developed and passed on by the apostles, that is non-negotiable. 
When God says stand up for something, we had better stand. When he says contend, we have to be willing to contend. When he says there's a, there's a faith worth fighting for, we had better say the same thing. Now, you can contend for the faith without being a contentious person. And that's a balance we have to maintain. You can contend without being contentious. I know there are some Christians that are very contentious. I'm not calling for that. You can contend without being contentious, but if you fail to defend, you might find yourself defenseless. Now, about out of time, but in verse 4, Jude uh, begins to introduce the troublemakers that he's dealing with in the first century. He told us his purpose in writing here in verse 3 to, to exhort us to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But now he's going to tell us why that's necessary. And, and what has happened, he says, is that there are some people who have slipped into the church, who have sort of wormed their way in to that church he was writing to, and he's very concerned about it. He describes them as condemned people. He, he describes them as godless people, as immoral people, and as people who by their behavior deny Christ. And, and Jude is gonna go on the rest of the letter and he's gonna describe them further. He's gonna use very colorful language, very uh, powerful detail about who they are. He's going to tell us everything about them except for what they're teaching. That seems very interesting to me. Uh, a lot of times when preachers get together, we like to talk about what somebody else is teaching. Jude doesn't tell us what they're teaching. He, they're very clearly false teachers but Jude doesn't tell us what they taught. What does he do? He tells us how they lived, how they acted, how they behaved. You see, what you believe will influence how you live and vice versa. What you understand and what you accept about this once for all delivered to the saints faith will have a lot to do with your lifestyle. And, and again, vice versa, it all ties together. Jesus said that you know a person by the fruit they produce. And you know, in coming lessons, we'll look at the behavior of a false teacher versus how a true believer conducts himself. I just, uh, until we get there, urge you to take up the challenge of Jude and be willing to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Because there are people out there who want you to, to water it down. And these are people that scripture condemns, who have no fear of God, who presume upon the grace of God to live any way they want to live. And in so doing, they deny that Jesus is Lord and Master. Let us make sure of what side we're on. Let's ask God's help on this. Holy God, we bow in your presence today, grateful that we have a day to lift your praises and to build up one another. Thank you for your word, which continues to be sharp and powerful. Help us to be faithful to it, to understand it as best we can, to lovingly share it with others, but to have courage to say what it says. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior, who offered his blood once to cleanse us and to give us a home with you. 
And we pray, Father, that if there are any that need to come back to him this morning or, or need to come to him for the first time in gospel obedience, they will have the courage to do so. Thank you for your love in Christ. Thank you for the privilege of being your children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If we can help you any further this morning in your relationship with the Father in any way, let us know what that is while we stand and sing this song.